rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand tribes. It's shouting time in heaven, a sinner once lost is found. It's shouting time in heaven, salvation has been brought down. No wonder the angels rejoice. Okay, Robert says we're ready to go. Um, let me read through verse 10. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 10. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich that he is made low because of the flower of because as a flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Okay. Uh, back over in verse 4. He's, what, he's been, what he's been talking about now, you'll remember he said, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Can't you imagine how that must have really thrown them for a loop? Of course, it tells us here that what it's telling us when he's saying that, he's saying that there were, very, there were a lot of trials around. And so he says, all these trials you're facing, all this persecution, whatever's coming up on you, uh, who, who puts bad on us? Satan. God only does good. Now, of course, that's what he's talking about here. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. If you are an understanding Christian, uh, if you are a Christian that, and this is how you should believe, that you believe God never does anything wrong. You believe that when something looks like that's not right, always remember it's you. It's not God. It's never God. We just need a better understanding. Jay had some of that in his prayer just a little while ago. Uh, when we, we need to understand what God is saying, and that's the reason we're here tonight studying. We need to understand what God is trying to get across to us, and we're only going to do that if we study his word, and when we finally figure it out that, that God loves us so that he is not, he's not going to put anything on us that we can't bear, he's not going to put anything on us or allow it to be put on us that, that we can't handle. He has a good reason for it. Because he's God, he only does good. Uh, I, I'm beginning to realize here lately that I just, I have never really under, I mean, I know God loves me, and I can say, God, I th thank you, you love me. 
Uh, that's like saying, I know God is uh, holy. But when you really start to study it, you realize that you haven't had the slightest idea what all that entails. His love for us is just so great. And his holiness is so great. Uh, when Moses was on the mountain, this is extra here, but uh, when Moses was on the mountain there uh, by the burning bush, and God said, take off your shoes. This is holy ground where you're standing. For Moses to have continued to stand there that close to that burning bush that was uh, a representation of God's presence, that would have, uh, that would have dirtied God's holiness. And he can't stand that. Same reason why when you're reading about the temple or anything else, have you ever noticed in, in there when you're reading about the, speci the specifications for the temple, any article, even a fork that they use to stick in the pot and pull out a piece of milk, that fork had to go through a ceremony to make it holy. Or it couldn't be there. That's the reason with Nadab and Abihu, when they offered strange fire, when they offered strange fire, the strange fire was something that God hadn't okayed. It was not holy. He killed them. We need to understand where our God is coming from. Now, here in James, this is what he's telling us here. We need to understand his holiness and if we will understand his holiness, we will, we will gain patience. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The patience is very important. Let me get back on the subject. But, or and, and with all these thoughts in mind about the trials you're going through, and let patience, or let's use the word endurance, Let's use the word endurance here. But let endurance have her perfect work. Or what he's saying, he's saying, I don't want you to ever quit. Whether you understand why this is happening or not, go ahead and count it joy because it comes from me. He says, it's coming from your father, so whether you understand that right now, which we don't a lot of times, you'll have something happen to you, and you might think, well, my, I, I've been a Christian for all these years. I wouldn't think God would let that happen to me. Listen, you need something in your life that's lacking, and God is making it possible for you to have that. And one thing that they needed here. They needed endurance. Uh, this was coming down to a very bad time in Christianity. Persecution was coming from all sides, from government, from Jews, from pagans. It was just coming from all over. God doesn't want them to fall away. Uh, notice, he doesn't tell them to pray that your problems will be taken away. He's telling them to pray that they are going to be able to endure these kinds of things. But let patience have her perfect work. I think I told you this before, but a good friend of mine, uh, he, he died, he's dead now, but he was, he was a member at Falls Mills. His wife gave me a little, well, size of a piece of notebook paper, um, and on it... It had a big shorebird, like a great blue heron. And that great blue heron had reached down and picked up what looked like a bullfrog. And I say looked like it because all you could see, and remember now, they, these birds, they swallow everything head first. Uh, all you could see was this frog's back feet and the back feet everything else is down the birds I'm sorry everything else is down the birds throat the back feet 
he twisted him around and he had a hold of that, that frog had a hold of that great blue heron squeezing the throat of that great blue, blue heron. And the caption underneath that said, never, never, never give up. That's what James is saying. Yeah, I, I got a. If I if I can ever see that again, I, I'll get you a copy. It is. It's just. But it says a lot. Don't give up. That frog was was all but gone. But he wasn't going to stop. He reached out and did whatever he could do, and he was squeezing that throat of that great blue heron to make sure that he could not swallow him any further. Than he had. I think the frog got away. I mean, there's no picture, but I think something like that got away. And that's what he's saying here. And that's what that's what God would say to us today. Never, never, never give up. Don't give up. Uh, how many suicides? My, I've had too many friends commit suicide, and I know you have too. <coughs> We learned in college, in, in psychology class, that you should never make a major decision in the nighttime. The majority of suicides happen in the night. People are tired, night, I can remember when my father-in-law was dying. He didn't want to be alone at night. He didn't want to be in the hospital. He wanted to be home where someone could be with him. And you ever notice with your kids, your kids have a fever. During the day, it seems to go away. When does that fever come back? Nighttime. Nighttime is just not a, it's just not a good time for us. And so... Uh, don't make major decisions in the nighttime, as, a, as I always do. I've gotten off the subject or something there, but uh, don't give up. Just let me give you another illustration. This, uh, this boy, junior high school, it's supposed to be a true story. That night when he got out of school, he cleaned everything out of his locker. He got all of his books and all the trinkets and that he'd carried, and he was carrying them home with him. And another boy that didn't hardly know him but was in his class was walking home and walked up on this boy that was carrying all the stuff that was in his locker home. And... The little boy that walked up on the boy that had cleaned out his locker, he began to talk to him, and he said, "What? Well, you think your parents would let me come, let you come over to my house tonight and stay all night? We'll, you know, we'll do something." And so the boy checked it all out, and he came over and he stayed that night with that boy. And the next morning, he told that boy that had asked him to stay all night. He said, "Do you know why I cleaned out my locker? He was going home." to kill himself because he thought nobody liked him. Crazy things happen with young people. But because that one boy befriended him at the last minute, he didn't kill himself. He went on to get straightened out and everything was okay. You never know. You never know. Don't give up. And that's what he's saying here, especially don't give up and kill yourself because you're not going to have a chance to straighten that out. Uh, so, but let patience or let endurance have her perfect work. Uh, that's what he's saying is going to be the result of your endurance. Patience, endurance... He says, let her have her perfect work. Now, by perfect there, he means let patience have its complete work in your life. In other words, you need something, and if you'll just not give up in the face of all of these trials, if you'll just trust me to take care of you, to get you through this, 
you're going to have more and more and more patience. So let patience have her perfect work. This should probably be something that we would put in a, a new converts class. Jay, you've seen it happen. Baptize them one day and you don't ever see them again. Something happens a lot of times. Look at the, look at the parable of the sower. The first seed that he sowed fell on the, uh, no, the first seed fell on the path. Second seed he sowed fell on rocky ground. It took root, popped up right away, and then the sun came out. The sun represented the troubles of this life. Some troubles came on him. He had accepted Christ. Some troubles came on him, and he was gone. Well, why would God let this happen to me? You know, I came, became a Christian, and they don't understand enough yet. So that ought to be one of the first lessons that we teach them, that listen, hang on, don't give up, keep studying, keep being faithful, and things will work out. Is there one of you here that aren't stronger in Christ today than you were when you were first baptized? It comes little by little by little. But like you've heard me say a lot of times, if you want flowers in the fall, you've got to plant them in the spring. If you want to be stronger in your Christian life, you need to be working on that right now. So let patience have her perfect or her complete work. This, was, this is the result of those trials, if you hold out, that ye may be perfect. And I want to, I'll, I'll describe that like this. He says, you will be perfect or you'll be, now he's not saying sinless perfection. That's, that's, that doesn't happen until you get to heaven. But when he says be perfect, he's saying be fit so you can be fit for the job that you were sent here by God to do. In God's providence, he has worked out things for us, and we miss a lot of it. And we miss a lot of it because we're not patient. We want it right now. We just want it right now. Uh, I'm old enough, and of course Bonnie's older than me, so uh, she's old enough too. Bonnie, why do I always get you? Uh, uh, I got a couple in my son, beg your pardon? Easy target. Yeah, I can look right out there and see you. Uh, Bonnie, we remember when there wasn't any instant pudding. There were no microwaves. Uh, everything was cooked by scratch. You just, you go in the kitchen and you had to make it. Well, not anymore. And this is what he's saying to them. Don't don't get impatient and quit. Hang on. That ye may be perfect and entire. Let me check the note on that. Oh, Entire or complete, as used here, describes the Old Testament sacrificial lamb that was suitable for sacrifice to God. It was Without blemish, it was complete in all of its parts. And it had to be because of what I mentioned earlier, to be holy for God. It had to be this. Or what happened to Nadab and Abihu would happen to somebody else. It had to be complete in all of its parts. Used of the Christian, or speaking about the Christian like he's doing here, it's saying that our character makes us usable to God. So what God is doing by allowing these trials to come your way, he's enabling you to grow stronger and stronger and stronger because he loves you so much he doesn't want to miss you in heaven. He wants your company in heaven. So he's saying, hold on. Don't give up. So you can be perfect or complete, entire, wanting 
nothing or lacking nothing. Facing our trials positively will little by little enable us to become more like Christ. Uh, it's a good book. Uh, I gave most of mine away to my brother. Uh, it's by Max Lucado. Now, you've got to be careful with Max. I think he's better now than he was, but he was, uh, he's Church of Christ, uh, non-instrumental, but he kind of sided in with denominationalism sometimes, but I understand, I don't read them anymore. I just don't have time. But he has written a book. It's the first one I got. Uh, one of the brothers from uh, Flemingsburg, Kentucky, gave it to me for some reason. The title of the book is Just Like Jesus. Hey, that's the way God wants us to be. This is a tremendous book. If you ever see it, get it. And like Eric, Eric, like Kevin Yeager always says when we, we talk about reading some of these books, that some of the things, some of the doctrine in them is not right. He said, eat the chicken and throw away the bones. And that's what you do. Uh, I prefer reading nothing but Church of Christ authors. But uh, I do read some others. Uh, but you've got to be careful. Okay. Uh, but let patience have her perfect work that or so that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The development of patience or endurance while under trial or while under pressure, isn't the final goal. Maturity in character is the goal. It's not the number of trials we face, but the result of the victories which come with endurance. Uh, because... Through all of these trials, God is trying to turn us into usable material. When we were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we were, what did Jesus say? Take up your cross and follow me. You know what he was saying? Die. To yourself. The cross represented death. Take up your cross and follow me. Die to yourself and follow me. That's basically what he's saying here. Put yourself out of the way. Make it all about Jesus. Whatever comes. Whatever comes. Uh, can you imagine if some of these radical Muslims broke in here tonight? Or they wouldn't have to break in. They could just come in. And they came in to murder. And they brought their great big sword with them or whatever they used to behead somebody. And they're going to behead all of us. Uh, of course, they're going to make us all watch as they behead the other ones. Can you imagine the, the terror that that would strike in us? Well, that would be okay to be terrified. But in your being terrified, you need to pray to God to give you the endurance, the patience, the stamina to let them go ahead and do what they're going to do. Uh, I think God will be with you uh, and he will take care of you as this goes on. Uh, we might, now I'm probably old enough that it's not going to I won't be here, but I might because this might happen right away. We're on the verge, Steve, tell him, we're on the verge of out-and-out -out nuclear war. You think so, Steve? Yeah. I don't see how it can be any, any other way. We might be like those early Christians. Uh, so we don't know, but we want we, of course, want to be ready. Uh, we want to be wanting nothing. And what he's talking about here is wanting nothing spiritually. 
We want to be able to handle any situation. We don't get up in the morning and say, well, God, here's what, here's what I want to do today. We ought to get up in the morning and say, God, what have you got for me to do today? And God, give me the faith to do whatever it is. Let's look at verse 5. If any of you, now, I think what James has done here, he's written this letter to them, and he's trying to put himself in their place. What are they going to think of this letter? Now, keep that in your mind a minute. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, now keep it in context, text. Wisdom about what? About counting it all joy when you fall into various trials. Because that had to sound wrong to them. I, don't, I didn't come to Christ to have trials, but we should have. We should have come to be able to handle them. So he says, if any of you lack wisdom, or if any of you lack the wisdom to understand what I'm talking about. Now remember, we just studied Proverbs. Wisdom is the best use of knowledge. So here we are, we've been told to count it all joy when we fall into various trials. And you say, well, I don't understand. I thought God loved me. I didn't want trials. I don't want trials. You should. You should. Now, I'm not going to tell you to pray for trials, but this is God's way to make us stronger. This is God's way to have other people see our strength and want to come to Jesus. I think this is one of the biggest reasons today we're not seeing the conversions we used to see. We're just not, we're, we're just not the witnesses that we need to be. We're not, uh, how many Christians today do you think are more materialistic minded than they are spiritually minded? Well, you just take a look at some of the things that are going on in various congregations where it's come, where it's all come down to, uh, I just read an article on this today. Uh, they talk about having Bible studies and all their, they're using the word Bible study like we used to use it, that we were going to study the Bible, but they're using the word Wednesday night Bible study and they don't even open a Bible on Wednesday night. They've come to play ping pong. I don't even know if they play ping pong anymore, but I remember I got a, I got a telephone call once from a good friend of mine who had, uh, who had just graduated from Bible college, and uh, he took a congregation in, actually in Connersville, Indiana, as their youth preacher. He called me. He was brokenhearted. He didn't know what to do. He said, Tom, what can I do? All these kids know is pizza parties. They don't have the slightest idea what the scripture says. Well, I said, then you've just got to, no matter what happens, you've got to start teaching them the scripture. Now, I don't ever know what happened. In that case, I've lost touch with him. But that's what's happened all over. So he says, if any of you lack wisdom, if you can't understand what it is I'm talking about, he says, let him or let that person... And this is a command. Let that person ask of God. Let him go to God and ask for that wisdom. God wants us to have wisdom. Well, that was one reason for us taking all the time we took in the book of Proverbs, that we would understand that wisdom is the best use of knowledge, and we're after God's wisdom. We're not after worldly wisdom, but we're after the wisdom of God the only way you can have the wisdom of God, if wisdom is the best use of knowledge, and it is to have knowledge about the Scripture, you won't know what to. You won't know what how to be wise. I mean, Jesus. Uh, Jesus said, "Him that believeth and is baptized will be saved." Peter says, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness." of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, you want to be wise about salvation? 
Take that knowledge that Jesus and Peter gave you and do it. Do it. That's wise. Make up your own mind. You want to be sprinkled? You want to be poured? You just want to pray through? You want to say the sinner's prayer, which isn't even in the Bible? Uh, you want to do that? Uh, that's not wisdom. Wisdom is the best use of knowledge. Take the facts that the Bible gives you and act on the facts. True faith is not blind. People say, oh, take a leap of faith. No, no. Obey the facts. That's wisdom. When you see what God has said and you do it. That's wisdom. The rest of this is just man playing God. Uh, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth, or God can, is continually giving to all men, that men is generic there, mankind, God gives to mankind liberally or generously, and it says, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him, or wisdom shall be given him. When he says, uh, upgradeth not uh, without reproach, uh, God, God doesn't want you to think it's a bother for you to keep asking, and, and that's what he says here. You keep asking and asking and asking. That's why the ETH is on uh, is on that word there. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in the present tense verb, present tense of some kind, where it's continual action. And I've told you that so many times. You already know it. But he says, this is, in other words, this is what God wants you to do. Uh, let me give you something about prayer. Did you ever want... I, now, I, I, I have done this. Did you ever wonder... God is all-knowing. Now, we know that's true. God knows everything. He knows your thoughts right now. He knew before creation what you'd be thinking right now. You, know, you can't hide anything from him. He knows everything. If God knows everything, why do you have to pray? Okay. Relationship. Now that's what I do in my, that's what my prayer time is all about. Uh, I pray and study at the same time because I want that time spent with God. And then you find as you're, pr as you're studying in your prayers, it's like using the Bible as your prayer list. Th the same things that were happening to them are happening to us today. But, Jay, I came upon this just, just the other day, and it might be something that everybody has always known. I think, and I definitely, you're probably number one on, the, your answer is probably number one for a rela that relationship with God. And if, if you don't believe that, just think of your relationship with your father. How poor it was or how great it was. And whatever, whether it was poor or great, it probably amounts to the amount of time you and your father spent together. Because you really got to know each other then. Peggy and I were married 50 years. Some of you are the same way. Uh, you can finish each other's sentences. You've been with each other so long. And I wish... Joe was here because I would tell her, Joe, be careful. You've been married to Jay long enough now that you're going to start to look like him. <laughs> I don't know if that happens, but I actually know people that they've had their dog for so long that I think they start looking like their dog. <laughs> oh, and of course, the dogs were poodles, but where was I? Um, he gives to all men generously and upbraideth not or he doesn't find fault with us asking and asking and asking he gives to all men liberal, liberally and upbraideth not and it notice this shall be given him wonder why he used the word shall S-H-A-L-L, -L, instead of will. Is there a difference in saying shall and will? I think so. This bothered me for a long time. And finally, I did a little bit of research. Sh 
shell is kind of lawyer or courthouse document language. You shall do this, not you will do this. Shell shows you that it's a demand. I, sh I shall go. Well, that's saying for sure. I'm going, and I, I will go. We ought to go. But that's not as strong as I shall go. So he says here, uh, and it shall be given him, or for sure, God's promised. He shall give you wisdom. It shall be given him. Now, do any of us want to be called a fool? No. That's like spitting in somebody's face. Well, what does God even say about it? You go to hell, you go calling people a fool. But do we want to be wise? Every one of us want to be wise. Every one of us would like to be the kind of person that when we talk, people listen because they know that what we have to say is going to be something wise. God wants us to be wise for our own good. Uh, I'm sure some people think about me. They say, Tom, all you ever talk about is us studying the Bible. There's a reason behind that. The reason behind that. I, I have never, I have never seen a weak Christian. I have never seen a troublemaker in the church that studies. I mean really studies. I'm not just saying reads five chapters so you can add them to the list on how many read this many chapters this week. I'm saying somebody that really studies. People that study and gain the wisdom that God wants them to have are the, are the joyful people in this world. That's why he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. So, ask God, he'll give it to you. But, now he's still talking about that prayer of asking God for wisdom. But let him ask in faith. Or these promises that he's just made will be all null and, null and void unless we ask in faith. Uh, if, you're, if you're just asking and you're not living a faithful life, I think there's probably one prayer that God, God is going to answer for you. God help me to repent. I think he'll answer that. But he tells us too many times. He even tells us, I think it's over in First or Second Peter, he says, uh, God's face, God's face is not toward them that are sinners. And that means somebody that uh, has presumptuous sin in their life or they've just got it in their life and they just kind of think well it doesn't make any difference I'll do it and do it and do it and do it their prayers aren't answered they just aren't answered he wants them to be uh, we should want them to be so whatever God tells us to do and we're not saved by our works but faith in what he's told us to do Faith in him should drive us to do the things he tells us to do. Uh, verse 6. But, by but he means instead of not asking in faith, but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering or not doubting that God is going to give you this wisdom that you're asking for if, if you believe him, that he will. Don't ask if you don't believe him. Now, he goes on with this, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. No, maybe God will do this and maybe he won't. For or because he that wavereth, and whenever I think of wavereth, I just think of this. 
you know, just limp-wristed and uh, just whatever comes, you know, I'll do it or I won't. Uh, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. <laughs> when I first wrote these notes, uh, first thing I thought about was like a wave driven with the wind. Of course, we've all been to the ocean and we've seen those waves come in and out, in and out. I thought of a little red and white fishing bobber. And you throw that out there and the wind's blowing and it's in and out and in. And out. In other words, the kind of person that isn't consistent. He's, he, sometimes he believes in God and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he believes God will do this and then he just doesn't know if God will or not. Uh, we need to understand if God said it, you can take it to the bank. It's, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. Now, like we were talking about patience, you might need the patience to wait on it. I prayed, I prayed for my father-in-law and my mother-in-law to become Christians. I started praying in 1967. I don't remember when they died, but he's been dead a good while. But I prayed for year, for decades for them to be Christian. I just did not quit. You know what? Before both of them died, they became Christians. Don't give up. Don't give up. Uh, uh, maybe sometimes you have to put them, maybe you have to put them on the back burner or change your prayers about them a little bit. Uh, I know with, with Peggy's dad, uh, we, we actually prayed that the cancer he had, and it was bad, uh, we actually prayed that that cancer would take him down so low that he would come to Christ. He'd have some questions, and he did. I answered the questions out of the Word, and he came to Christ. Her mother was basically the same way. So don't, uh, uh, don't waver. Believe God will do it. Uh, let me try to, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now, notice where the answer from prayer comes from. From the Lord. Do we understand that God only answers the Christian's prayer? This has caused me a lot of trouble in ministries. I remember one man when I was had the school at Holmes Hill. I forget what it was, but we were standing beside his car, and I said something. He said, I'll pray for you. And I said, it won't do you any good. I was looking for an opening. And I was saying this very kind. You wouldn't want to say that to everybody. But sometimes you just got to be very blunt. And I had tried everything with this guy. What do you mean? God hears everybody's prayers. I said, well, it depends on how you're looking at the word hear. He hears audibly everything. But the Bible also talks about God hearing or us hearing to the point that action is taken. Only the Christian has the benefit of Jesus being our high priest, our father. Only the Bible tells us that it's only Jesus that takes our prayers to God. So it only makes sense. If you're not in Christ, if you're not in God's family, who do children go to usually and ask for things? They go to their dad. That's who I go to, my daddy, my God, and ask him for things. Uh, this is a good way to really maybe start somebody in a study. But when you tell them these things, you've got to tell them in love. You can't just some, come out to spite them and say, well, God doesn't answer your prayers. You've got to tell them right. 
You've got, it's like saying uh, you, you Christians believe that uh, you're the only ones being saved. And uh, what do you say to them? Well, you've got to tell them the truth. But you tell them the truth in love. Uh, and that makes a big, big difference. And we will be responsible for that. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Don't expect wisdom if you're a wavering Christian, if you're just blown from this spot to that spot, today you believe, tomorrow you don't, uh, don't, expect, don't expect him to ask your prayers. You can't just pray and expect God to do what you ask him. He's got rules in here that you have to obey. Uh, how many times do we, do we hear it? Uh, uh, the only thing left to do was pray, so I prayed. No, prayer ought to have been the first thing that you did, not the only thing that you've got left to do. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, we'll start with verse 8 next time. Seven. I just did seven. Bonnie, uh, w uh, Vernon... <laughs> Slap her in the back of the head and give her a, what was, what's that guy's name? Gibbs. Give her that Gibbs hit in the back of the head. <laughs> what did he hit you with? A book, Sunday, the songbook. That was an accident. He's seen that. He's seen Wish Not Coming. Father in heaven, we thank you. We praise you for Jesus. And Father, we thank you for giving us your word. Father, we thank you that you want us to have your wisdom. But Father, we also understand that we need to ask for it. Father, help us not to be like the world and just make up our own rules. And help us not to be like the world and decide that this is what you will accept and, and then just not carry out your will. Father, you are our Father. You are our guide. Father, Jesus is the great shepherd. And, Father, we depend on him to tell us what we need to know. And we know he always tells the truth. Help us to always follow the truth, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Lost is found, it's shouting time in heaven.